Are we ready? Okay, everyone. Are we ready? Am I up? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming to our little uh, demonstration. I'm Paul Schreiber of Synthesis Technology. This is Robert Rich, and uh, he's been a good friend and endorser. And uh, from the first MOTM days, we were reviewing electronic musician, and all he complained about was, where's all the LEDs? But if that's the worst thing you can say about my gear, I'm happy. Um, Robert's going to give a concert tomorrow night at the Ambient Church. Um, hope to see some of you there. It's not sold out. It's going to be uh, a full concert with lights and uh, keyboards and flutes. Flutes, lap steel guitar. Lap steel. I have a Hawken continuum Hawken there. Continuum. And uh, two keyboards. And it's, we've had some expressed concern that, well, I use Ableton. Does that mean it's all going to be clips and just somebody doing their email on stage? No. I, <laughs> there's a lot of looping. There's a lot of interaction. And, uh, you'll, and hopefully I'll show you today some of the ways that Ableton can actually be used, uh, you know, integrating with live electronics as well. And so, yeah. Right. So um, for the uh, good news is I'll be very little talking on this time, and there's no PowerPoint. <laughs> I've given in permission, though, to, to interject if I say something stupid, which happens commonly with me. Because when my, when my mouth is moving, my brain stops. I have this problem where... where the only way I can talk is to, is to stop thinking. So what happens is sometimes I just go off the rails. So we'll see. He does like crows and ravens. So if he talk, starts talking about crows and ravens, that's the signal he's gone off the rails a little bit. <laughs> so what we're going to show here is uh, some different patching and synthesis techniques that Robert's used over the years. Um, he started off using my equipment with an album called Bestiary. And uh, if you haven't heard Bestiary, I suggest you go to robertrich.com and check it out. It's probably still today the best pure modular album I think I've ever heard in terms of technique that you listen to it and it doesn't sound like what you think a modular is supposed to sound like. I know that there's been a lot of uh, demos on YouTube over the years about people doing uh, the Dollis Jam or whatever and showing off their stuff on the modular and I'm hoping that tonight you'll get a little bit different taste that that's not all that the, it's capable of doing. In fact, what you're going to be hearing is simply all straight from the system. There's no pre-recorded audio. It's all done over MIDI. And uh, with that, we'll let Robert take it away. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, I was uh, writing re synth reviews for synthesis for. Uh, um, See, I've already started <laughs> for an electronic musician back in the 80s and 90s to help augment my income. And, and I was starting to stop, I was beginning to fade away from writing that and t told the editor that I was probably not going to write any more articles. And he said, well, there's this guy that really wants you to do a review of his modular synths. Would you decide to start writing for that, you know, to, to do that review? I said, really? Modular synths are coming back? Since when did that happen? This was around 1998 or so. And so I picked up, you know, he, we, we met in, in Silicon Valley, you know, San Francisco Bay Area. And he set me up with about seven modules of MOTM stuff. But I had to build a cabinet first. So <laughs> to do the review for this magazine, I ended up having to make furniture. And then two years later, I'm, I'm at NAM helping him demo for people how to use it. And... Uh, Steve Oppenheimer, the editor, comes by and says, is this a conflict of interest? <laughs> it's like, oh, busted. Yeah, we became friends. And I've been um, uh, a major you know, proponent of Paul's designs uh, ever since. Because I got started back in the 70s building Paya stuff from kits. Because I was 13 years old. It was paper route money and gardening and babysitting. And you could build an oscillator for $36. You know, you could, you could do one of those every two weeks or something like that. And after a year, you have some system that sort of has a lot of hum and background noise and you can make frog sounds with it. Um, you know, and so the, the, the design of Paya stuff was so bad that when I saw the modern 1990s version of what modular could do, I was, I was astonished because it was built really, really well. And I realized that what Paul was doing was audiophile analog. 
and I've been a proponent of this idea of hi-fi, lo-fi, being able to integrate the best of, of high gain, high frequency bandwidth, uh, low noise, good dynamic range, in a system that allows you to do strange, crazy things and to go a little bit off the rails and have some fun. Uh, so I, I think it gives you the best of both worlds. Um, a lot of the Eurorack modules don't have quite the, the dynamic range and gain structure that Paul's modules have. And so then the, the trick is sometimes to integrate really good glue modules to stick that together. Um, I'm fond of IntelliGel. I'm fond of especially this Russian guy who goes by L1. Uh, his stuff is really good uh, for mixers, uh, VCAs. His analog gain structure is as good as Paul's. And Paul actually recommended that stuff. So um, my music is often rather tonal, um, but also branches out into realms of, of pure sound design. But I just have kind of an intrinsic tendency to like smoother, more um, uh, velvety kinds of sounds. Uh, I use a word like velvety because I'm somewhat uh, synesthetic. Um, I'm also a mastering engineer, and the, the way I often hear or experience sound is texturally. So a lot of people think of synesthesia as being more of a sound into light or color, or color into sound, or letters and things. But to me, sound sort of is, is um, something that's somatic, almost internally somatic. And so I tend to be rather um, sensitive to loud noises or to really abrasive things. Um, it, it feels scratchy. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable. And so oftentimes I'm attracted towards things that are a little bit more mellifluous. Uh, and so because the world of modular experimentation tends to, to live more in the realm of industrial and techno and stuff that's much harsher, um, I thought it might be interesting for you to see some approaches that are kind of in a different direction, even though I'm, I'm not averse to exploring those territories. Um, so what I start with here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build up a patch, um, which I've already kind of begun because otherwise you'd get bored stiff. Um, I'm not a really fast patcher. I have to think about things a little bit. So I've, I've given myself a head start. But I'm going to build a patch that would be a typical thing for me to play live with up to four voices, which then I can have loops coming from Ableton, and it would just be coming off the modular. Robert, you might want to mention that they're MIDI loops and not... That's right. These are not audio not, loops. So there's, audio there's no audio coming out of the Motu right there. There's a, there's a uh, Motu ultralight, and you can see it's just a MIDI cable. So MIDI is going into a Yarns right here, uh, four channels. So it's MIDI mode four, uh, four monophonic voices, channels one through four, and audio is turned off. So if you want to see how I might improvise with this, there's a fairly heavily viewed YouTube video from a live radio concert from around 2014, was it? I forget the year, on a radio station called KFJC. So if you go on YouTube and look for Robert Rich Live KFJC, those radio call letters, you'll see a, a one hour or more, like 70 minute long, improvised concert, completely improvised, where I've got a, a mono rocket system just about the same size as this, um, playing uh, live electronics with keyboards and looping and things. And there's a little bit of audio coming out of Ableton, but it's mostly the kind of stuff I'm showing you. So I thought I'd show you a little trick, first of all, which is a step that many people forget to do in their patching world, which is to tune the oscillators first. And what I have here in Ableton is just a repetition of A440, basically, you know, A3 in a MIDI note, looping, you know, it's like a, a four bar long note that just loops. And I've got it on all four channels. And so the first thing I do is I just play that and I b begin with one. Now I'm not tuning this relative to A440 right now because I have no keyboard reference or a, a frequency counter. So basically, I'm just going to start with that. And then I'm cheating because I've already kind of tuned things. I'm just going to kind of mess things up a little bit. So, so. Yeah, so right now, all four voices are coming out of an E370, which is a four voice uh, digital hybrid oscillator. Okay, so this is 
Oscillator 1, and I'm just going to pretend that that's A440. It's, it's within 50 hertz, probably. And so I'm just going to tune the others to that. And I'm going to turn off the delay. It's I'm also going to good. I turn down that one before I turn up the next one because it'll start getting Beat City if I have all three up, right? So close enough for rock and roll. Of course, this is the time I could decide if I want one of these to be an octave higher or something. It's no big deal. Um, okay, so now we've got everything's pretty closely in tune. Let's say that I want my first voice to be a bass line. I've actually got parts of uh, the sequence from an album that I did in 1985. Um, the, the album is called Numina. The piece is called The Other Side of Twilight. And I did it all on a Prophet 5 using Dr. T's keyboard control sequencer on a Commodore 64. Um, so <laughs> recorded to no that was um, there's a funny story I actually finished my college education a quarter early and I had grant money to go to school and so without telling anybody including my parents I took the four thousand dollars of grant money and and I bought a used Otari 5050 uh, Mark three half inch eight track and I recorded it was I, all my other albums before that were recorded either live to two track or on four track cassette Porter Studio. And so, so Numina was the first thing I ever did multi-track reel-to-reel. Um, and it was with uh, a Prophet 5 and a bit of my home-built modular and, um, and Dr. T on a Commodore 64. So I rebuilt the MIDI files for that in order to play this really old piece live. And I'll actually be opening tomorrow's concert with this piece. Um, and it will be coming out MIDI. Um, when I play the other side of Twilight, I do it entirely live. So, so basically, the first voice, and I'll be doing it though with a Prophet 12, with a, with a Dave Smith Instruments Prophet 12, which is closer to the original, because it wasn't done with a modular, it was actually done on a Prophet 5. So, um, so what I'm going to do here is basically set um, the first voice to um, a... a it, this is going to be... Uh, ROM bank B, uh, you can't read that, but there's three banks of ROM uh, wavetables. I actually created the wavetables, all but about 50 of them that are from the PPG library and also Eric Bromba, who did all the software heavy lifting. Paul did all the hardware heavy lifting on this. Um, they, Paul asked me to come up with uh, wavetables that made sense instead of the old PPG, you know, when you scan through them and they just make random buzzy sounds. So it took me a couple months to figure out a concept of building harmonic series complexity in a matrix uh, so that it could be a vector that you could move in several directions. And if you're interested in that, I can go into some of the concepts behind the ROM wavetables. Yeah. And since now that with these new bigger, uh, modules with the ones that have a bigger chip in them. I've also been doing a bit of extra uh, 64 wavetable things where you can scan through the entire thing as a z-plane, um, especially some Chebyshev functions using the software that's provided for free with it, so um, with WaveEdit. Oh, wave yeah. yeah. So, so I've got some of the, my Chebyshev uh, banks in here too. But, um, you know, so the main concept of these banks is that ROM A were basically something that hadn't happened before, which was very smooth uh, waveforms. So they're starting out with sine waves, and I just did sine waves harmonics 1 through 16, because I use a lot of harmonics, and especially in cloud mode, we get all sorts of interesting stuff. And then various things that are sort of power functions of sine waves, so it's odd, even power functions, exponential, and then two banks, which I think I've gotten a bit of flack for, of, of Hammond organ, drawbar tones. I basically looked up the historical Hammond organ draw bars from various popular musicians um, and recreated them with um, the power functions 
calculated from the way that the, the drawbar's uh, gain structure works. And so what I learned by the, that, by the way, when I made those drawbar uh, wave tables, is I learned immense respect for Rick Wright from Pink Floyd, because some of his uh, organ settings were some of the most creative and interesting Hammond organ drawbar settings I'd ever seen. They were really cool, like neat little harmonic subtleties that you pick out in there. Um, then the very top row of bank A is uh, kind of like a filtered synth waveform. It's sort of a rounded square saw sort of bank. Then in B, we've got some of Eric's vocal wave tables and some of the PPG wave tables. But also, I did one that I'll be trying to, to find here properly, which is a bunch of pulse width modulations. So it's the second row of bank B basically is, is 50% pulse width going to 10% pulse width. And what's interesting is you morph through those, it sounds slightly different from pulse width modulation. It sounds similar, but there's a slightly different harmonic character because there's a little morphing thing going on. Um, but then what a lot of people don't see is that in bank C, there's a lot of really weird asymmetrical functions that are designed primarily to be low frequency oscillators. So you set them to really low frequencies and they can create asymmetric waveforms. There's a lot of things that would create that you would need three or four modules to do uh, to create those things. You, there's frequency <coughs> modulated and amplitude modulated uh, wavetables where they, 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 multi they, they, they wiggle many times in the cycle and they amplitude uh, modulate as well. Uh, so basically you would need uh, FM, so you would need two oscillators, you would need an envelope and a VCA that can work at DC uh, levels uh, to be able to create those, which is at least four modules. And some of them would be very difficult to create in an analog because I've got some asymmetrical waveforms, some things that are like round at the top and then jaggedy at the bottom, things like that. So things that actually have DC offset, stuff that would actually be impossible in an analog, in a purely analog setting. Um, and then further up in the C bank, you get some things that, that I, I have various words for them, spindles and blips and glitches. Um, there's, there's a whole bank of things that, that are sort of random and then jerk. So they're, they're like sort of hiccupy brownie in motion. Um, and, and the idea was that you could modulate these, either frequency modulate them or cross modulate them with each other. You could put FM of one noise waveform into the frequency of the other and randomize it. So now it becomes semi-random stimulus. So, so I can try to show that later on um, using these glitch functions to trigger envelopes and things like that. So it can become like a, a chaos generator. Um, and then the very top row is noise from pink noise to white noise, uh, or actually like brownie in motion to white noise. And these are all in a single wavetable. So the idea is that you use them in low frequency mode and you get all this very complex um, power out of this idea of using a digital wavetable. Um, now, I, I know a lot of people end up just running the thing as an audio oscillator, and it sounds you know, it, it, very, very bright, and then you put a lot of low-pass filter on it, and they just sweep it up and down, and it just goes <laughs> But it's much more interesting to actually look at the pictures and to see, wow, that's actually like a really complex waveform, and you can put it into a frequency modulation of an LFO and, and do something that you would require lots and lots of modules otherwise to do. Um, but showing like a very simple kind of thing here, this is the way I would build um, the a four voice, or in this case the first one is a three voice patch to play the second part of Other Side of Twilight. So if you want to have this, go ahead and use the waveform, change the 370 to the waveform display from the... Well, first I'm going to just bring up the audio here. So. so. Okay, so one of the characteristics of, of the way I'm always tending towards patching is, is to use the filters a lot to, to roll off a lot of the high end and try to create a more woody, more organic sort of tone. So now in this case, I've got uh, an ADSR, it's an IntelliGel dual ADSR. I'm using the negative output to go into FM2 
of a 440 four pole oscillator. This is a OTA oscillator, so it'll resonate all the way down to low frequency. And. <laughs> right. That's right. And what's nice here is that FM2 is an inverting um, uh, input, attenuator. reverse attenuator. Thank you. That's what you're here for. See? And so, so I can take the negative output and I can make it go positive. And then just try to get it kind of nice and subtle there. So, so this is the baseline of this piece. And then, so now this is the sine wave, but what I'm gonna do though is get it up to that organ to, So this is in the Hammond organ bank. I'm gonna roll that off a little bit. So now there's no modulation on this. One of the things that I am prone to doing is using a lot of LFOs. LFOs are something you never have enough of. And typically what I'll do is I will put LFOs into almost any place that there is a spot on a module. So, so the idea here is to put some slow moving, you know, need more patch chords. Yeah, I, I, my patches use a lot of patch chords. Um, so, so now, suddenly we start getting a little bit more life with things, right? Because slow moving filters, and so there's not a lot of repetition. It's, it's living and breathing now. This is one of the things that makes modular synthesizers so much more powerful than, than preset synthesizers, is that you can create a lot of events that never repeat a lot of notes that will play differently every time. And so the way to do that is lots and lots of cross-modulation. And so there's never enough LFOs. That's why today I actually have the other digital oscillator here set up more as an LFO than for audio, because I'm only going to be using the four voices here. So, you guys hear the music okay? Turn it up a little louder. Okay. So, yeah. So, I've also got this mono output. This is summing in mono. It's a uh, IntelliJ Linux, six input to, or five input to one output, basically. And I'm going into uh, Paul's 580 resampling delay. That's because this is a trick that I often will use in a small system to create stereo, but also just to get a lot more life and, and, and you know, movement in the sound. And so we're actually coming to something that starts sounding like a finished piece of music almost. In, in this case, this piece, I would have some more MIDI notes coming out to, uh, somebody trying to get into the thing, to, uh, to the a Korg M3 playing some string patches and sweeps and stuff. And then I'd be playing Glissando guitar to this. So we can uh, even put another thing here. Now I'm going to put an LFO onto the third oscillator sine wave. So now we're sort of scanning through those, those harmonic series. And they'll kind of come up and, and start breathing. And now we've got stuff that's really... Now there's no filter and there's no VCA on that. It's just, just droning. Now before I start, I would, I would set up delay times here so that they're in a place I like. You know, do something like that or... So now, oh, look at that, thank you. Far out. That's just for the LFOs. <laughs> That's right. That's just for the LFOs. So, that'd be an example of performing in this part, it's just two main melodic parts, but with three voices. Um, 
there's other times that I'll be using the modular more as a textural backdrop. So what I've got in Ableton is a whole bunch of these wiggly bits. Basically, oftentimes, uh, different keys of just fifths. And, and I've got the loops of fifths, um, which I'm, I, put, I enter in just by hand playing them. I'm just kind of doing this on a keyboard. And then, then I'll have MIDI channels one through four playing the same loops, all synchronized, but just different times so that they're wibbling around. And so it sounds something like this. So now see what I can do is put a lot of slow LFO on these filters so that I don't have to do that by hand. Now this is part of the, this advantage to having these very sinusoidal smooth timbres in bank A because if I'm running out of filters, I can actually create these silky smooth sounds with no filters at all. And there's plenty of harmonic interest, and there's a lot of motion happening because the morphing algorithms are allowing these wavetables to move very slowly into each other. So I can do something which is filter-like, but different. And it's changing the overtones in ways that are specific to wavetable synthesis. And this kind of thing, of course, you know, can sound really nice with very dense echo. If there's one synthesis to I think is especially good with that kind of thing, it's Maquette Giraudy. Um, she was in Gong in the mid-70s, filled in for Tim Blake when he was having drug problems. And she and Steve Hillage, the guitarist, the lead guitarist in Gong, uh, have been a couple ever since the mid-70s. Um, I've done a few festivals with them. They're just fantastic people. And Maquette uh, if you want an, an amazing album from the late 70s called Rainbow Dome Music. Yeah. And it's, it's an improvised album of Steve and Maquette playing in a, in a big uh, dome theater in London, uh, around, I think around 1978 or 9. And, and she's doing a lot of this, this riffling echoes uh, in fifths, creating these just beautiful shimmering waves of sound while he's soloing. And... Um, and so when I'm getting that kind of thing, I must say I'm actually just totally ripping off Maquette. And uh, <laughs> pick, your, you know, pick your favorites. An another person who I really respect for this sound on the Serge is Michael Stearns. So an album of his from the, uh, around 1980 called uh, Planetary Unfolding is using the big Serge, which actually Kevin Verhaney helped set up for him. And um, he's using the, uh, the, the analog memory. You have one. Uh, the the analog, analog shift, shift register. register. Yeah. Which is, I call it the E102 temporal shifter, but it's, it's yeah. a digital version of the analog shifter. Yeah, so an analog shift register is basically like a, it's, it's a voltage version of an echo, and you can have different voices happening with all sorts of different timbres going on. And you can hear some amazing stuff that Michael was getting with that on the Serge, uh, you know, 35 years ago. Um, being a cheapskate and having to travel as small as I can, I just like getting that same sound with a lot of delays. But um, this is yeah, yeah. So so basically, it's like, and what I've got here though is different keys of it, so I can suddenly change keys. Notice I've got those three LFOs moving every voice around, so everything's just slowly shifting. And I'm making a really good synthesis of a motorcycle as well. You hear that?
something I like very, very much about OTA filters is that their resonance goes equally loud all the way down to LFO amplitude. So the famous ladder filter in a Moog has a squawky sound because the resonance tends to fall away with lower frequencies. And so you'll have it in medium resonance and it will chirp if you give it a bright, if you give it a big voltage spike because it'll go into full resonance in higher frequencies, but then it'll sound more buzzy and open in low frequencies, which is great for certain things. It'll have a little bit more overtones coming through. But what I love about OTA filters is that you can get them all the way down to, to I use them as LFOs sometimes. Especially this OTA filter. This one. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, is based on a Bob 5 chip. Which was an SSM chip that uh, 2040 that uh, Dave Rossum designed. Now, are you, do you have stereo filters? Are you sure? No, I'm sure. I'm, everything's going in mono, and the stereo is coming out through the delay. So everything's coming out. Uh, through the delay. And so yeah. <laughs> the way that's done is that this particular delay design, the 8580, it has mono in but two outputs. And one output is a percentage from zero to 100 percent of the main output. So if you have a, a 50 millisecond delay as the main output, the other one can be from zero to 50 milliseconds. It's in 1,024 steps, and that position is voltage control. And, so, and so that's what you have. You, you take the main output on one channel and the tapped on the other channel, and then you have the stereo effect. Yeah. And I, because I'm trying to create a small package that can do a lot and sound really good, I use that as my stereo output. It's real cheesy, I mean, because it means everything's going through echo. But I'm not trying to do everything on an album with a little rig like this. You know, I'm trying to do interesting live things that have some, some breath to them, some movement. You know, so uh, the other thing that is interesting with filters these days is that people have a lot of opinions about filters good for this or that purpose, especially people in techno or industrial really want filters that, that have some intensity, some harshness. And what they don't realize is that a well-designed OTA filter has some of the best clipping characteristics, internal clipping characteristics. And so if I were to take something like, just turn off this and take, for example, that little baseline thing uh, here, let me see here. So here's that bass line again. Turn that off. So theoretically, we should have something like that. So my only point here is to show you that if we bring the drive up, and bring the resonance up, a little bit and it can get extremely fat so, so if I were to speed up our tempo let's say just so that we get a few more notes in a short time so in this case it's not techno it's not a really fast sequence or anything. the point being though that we can get this real snappy and the snap will clip a little bit. I've got the drive way up. And this is what we get with the OTA. We can get this huge low end. <laughs> and, and make it real sharp. So that kind of, you know, you can, you can get it to snap and you can get it to snarl, is all I'm saying. And if the four pole is cutting off too much high frequency, there's a three pole output, which is that 303. So that's going to have a little bit more of that slightly open 303 kind of sound. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite filters in modular um, because it's, it's really, really wide use. You know, it has a lot of um, 
Versatility is the word I'm looking for. The other filter which I'm a huge fan of is one uh, designed by Scott Ryder, Old Crow, which has been in MOTM format for years, the 480 filter. Um, and Paul's coming out with one soon, right? Uh, in the spring of next year, after Christmas. Yeah, so, so Old Crow, if you've never heard of him before, um, he lives in Chicago, and he's made a, a hobby, like a full-time hobby, out of making, redesigning all of the components of a CS80. So that if, if you wanted to build a CS80 from scratch, you wouldn't need any of Yamaha's custom chips. In fact, you could theoretically take all of the components, all of the different module, you know, modules that Scott has built and, and retrofit them into a CS80 and it should sound almost identical, except more stable <laughs> and, and probably wouldn't break if you carried it. So uh, the, the thing that makes the 480 filter so special for me, and I've got, so, so Crow has one that he is selling right now uh, for uh, Euro rack, which is big, and it has the built-in extra VCAs in it. And Paul's is going to be a little bit smaller, which is handy, because the VCAs are kind of low gain. I find them a little bit wimpy. So it's, it's, I find it hard to use the extra structure, you know, the extra construction in, in that module. And I find that just the, uh, the low-pass, high-pass uh, parts are all I really use in it, in the MOTM. Uh, the thing that makes it so special is that whereas the low-pass filter is really great for getting that snappy, thick low end, sometimes I need shimmering high stuff that is fizzy and open and smooth and silky. And there's a really unusual phase uh, shift characteristic that Yamaha designed into the 480 where the, the, at the um, threshold of the, envelope, of, of the filter cutoff, um, the sharper your resonance, it will never start ringing. It, it, it can't really go into hard resonance unless you put a feedback chain in it. Um, you, you can cause it to resonate by actually patching an input, a feedback input. But they've got all these phase shift uh, circuits in there that, that get it swirly and soft. And so you can get things that would otherwise be sort of abrasive and bright and, and they get swooshy and, and velvety. And it's really great if you need these high shimmering sounds to open up, you know, to get something happening in your tweeters basically. Um, and uh, I, I think it's pretty special. Uh, so another unusual way that sometimes I'll use a laptop for MIDI is if I don't have enough modules in my case to do a lot of complex uh, wiggly bits, um, sometimes I will just create chaos loops um, and I just call them noise. And so basically what we've got here are a bunch of channels of just really fast wiggling. And it's, it's not random because it's a loop of, of me doing this on a keyboard. But, What's but. That, <laughs> that looked pretty random to me. I'll yeah. Like so. Is that good bot two parts? So let me see here. Do I want to turn this on? So. I, let me see here. Wait, So this is what I'm talking about here, right? And so that's just that's just oscillators wiggling really fast. Right? I've got things turned down really low here, so you can keep that down. So, so now the point isn't that I want to sound like you know the, the bridge of a bad cheap science fiction starship. The point is that I can take one of those voltages, and I can stick it into a filter, and so, so now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to kind of start going off the rails, right? So this is where I'm going to be repatching as I talk, and I'm going to come up with some new patches as I'm talking. And they might or may not work, right? Because I'm actually not really um, planning from this point onwards very much. And so also, if you have questions, you can ask. Um, so, but What's this? Let's stop. Does anybody have any questions so far? Do you want to ask Robert? Yeah. Well, the, 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 random, so the random MIDI is giving you uh, quantized Yeah, it's, pitch, they're just notes. Material. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it saves from doing like a noise yeah. uh, sample and hold. Exactly. Or, or, or it's, or just, yeah. it's just a way to make more wiggling notes, right? But, but, but with the MIDI to CD. Yeah. yeah. But you are like attenuating something or like that. It's just right now, it's just coming out of the one volt per octave. Okay, so you're just putting it straight in there. Yeah. 
Somebody else had a question? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so you, you mentioned about using uh, harmonic series 1 through 16. Uh -huh. uh, what, what have you found outside of 16? So 16 to, say, 32 and beyond. Well, I was going to run out of, of wavetable space is all. Right. So I just stopped at a certain point. Uh, I, I do a lot of work in microtuning, a lot of just intonation, and uh, one of the tunings that I use for special effects is I, I designate all 60 notes of, you know, 61 notes of a five octave keyboard to harmonics one through 60, right? Okay. So, so the, I'll, I'll set the low C to be an A55, right? And then it'll be, the, the next note will be A110, and then it'll be the fifth, and then, you know, and so way up top of the keyboard, it's, it's really, really close, right? Right, right? And really, really high frequencies. But what you can do with that is you can create these, uh, if you have a polyphonic synthesizer, you can create something that has a slow attack and slow release and just kind of swoop your fingers up and down the keyboard. Like a Harry Parch sort of. Yeah, except it's all harmonic and so it goes, it sounds like a filter sweep, except totally unlike a filter sweep. Um, on my album Below Zero, which came out in 1996, uh, there's a 20 minute piece called Star Maker and I'm doing a lot of sound designing uh, using that with a, um, that tuning on a DX7. So I've basically got, uh, I like the DX7, it's a good synth. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity abuser of synthesizers. Um, so, you know, the, basically a sine wave, a cloudy sine wave, uh, you know, with a slow attack, slow release. And, and then I was using, at the time I was reviewing um, an optical Thing that would send out MIDI notes and, you know, it actually, Roland bought the product and it ended up getting into some of their DJ gear. Um, and so I was just spewing out MIDI notes by moving my hand up and down and it, it created these cool little s ribbons in space, you know. Um, so I was... Called the, the D beam. <laughs> yes. So, so what I was going to do here... So the point here is... This is just putting one of those random voltages into the filter. And this can create this kind of nice bubbling. And so that's done with only two modules, three, three, three modules, really. So we've got just got MIDI, you know, it. The, the, it's just one note coming out of this other oscillator, right? So it's just basically MIDI wiggling a filter going through an echo. So that's all you're hearing. So another thing I tend to do a lot of is modulation. So especially audio frequency modulation. So in fact, why don't we just take that as... I'm gonna, let me just find something here that's going to have a few wiggly bits. Um, okay. So this is just, um, these, these were just some melodic loops that I, I did for, maybe it was that KFJC performance or something. So, so turn everything here off, there we go, so we just have the filter, and we should, there we go. So. Now, I was going to quickly show some ideas with audio rate modulation. I'll um, still got, let's see. As I said, I'd, I'd start getting a little more stammery and stuttery here when I. Um, okay. okay, so I've got a pretty simple sound right now. I'm going to put a bit of an LFO on it just to make it kind of. Do something. Let me see. Take that off. And let me see here. I've got a loose LFO over here. So. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so. I'm gonna make the filter do a little bit less. And so now I'm, I'm using this. Uh, square waves kind of thing. So what I'm going to do though is I'm going to take it into something that's a bit more like a sine wave. And I'm going to do that by going here to voice one. 
and I'm going to go to ROM A. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to one of my Chevy Chev. Here we go. Okay. So now this is a Chevy Chev wave function. And I'm going to take an output here, oscillator 4, and I'm going to put it into FM. So this is audio rate modulation. This is a digital oscillator. They didn't used to be able to do this. The reason it can do that is the processors are getting really fast. So, so the processor in the E370 runs at 220 megahertz. Yeah, so, so we're just taking audio output. Now I've got my FM turned down. And so there's FM, right? This is FM in a digital oscillator. So that's actually pretty cool. Now I'm going to back out and I'm going to make sure that I'm here. So, so now I'm going through these harmonics, sine waves. Now, I'm also going to scan through these. So let's see. So I'm going to stick an LFO into those guys as well. So now I'm scanning through the Chevy chip filters. So we've got what is very close to on the verge of frying bacon. Um, but the point is we've got a lot of overtones. We've got complex waveforms being modulated by a very high frequency sine wave. Now we can start modulating that guy too if we want. Okay, so that's pretty nasty. Now let's just roll it off. That's the frying bacon part, right? So, but we're... That's right. So, but we're going to turn the LFO part of it down as FM2. Okay. There you go. So I guess the point that Robert's making here is that in the past it was very difficult for any kind of digital oscillator to be audio rate frequency modulated and generate stable output that's high tones without going what's called aliasing, which is um, when the frequency actually wraps around itself in this audio spectrum, but mm -hmm. with these faster ARM. So this is actually running on a 220 megahertz, 32-bit ARM processor. And uh, it's running at a 192 kilohertz sample rate. So, you know, what's funny is that the, F, the, the Yamaha DX7 was a digital FM synthesizer. Turns out that they had to make custom silicon, and all that chip could do was pretty much that one FM algorithm. It was hardwired for it. So the nice thing here is that we've, we've got that frying bacon tweeter tester, but with this nice, thick, low-frequency oscillator, we can, we can get it to be quite musical. So, if we, you know, we can also get all sorts of more chaotic things, but I'll back away from that for now. And um, I think I'll just show you one more approach that sometimes I'll take. And this is going to go uh, <laughs> much more trickily. <laughs> is that a word? Um, we'll see if I can pull this off. Uh, so oftentimes, I'm going to patch while I try to talk here. Um, I like to use time domain synthesis within an analog domain. It's something I've been asking from designers for years, and uh, it's now possible. This is what's getting so cool. And Eurorack is really the realm where it's happening. Um, back when we started doing analog synthesis, you know, analog is really good at frequency domain. It, everything is happening in real time with almost no time delay. 
There's no time lag except a slight phase shift occasionally, which is in microseconds. And uh, what's happening now is because a lot of these modules are actually using digital guts, uh, and memory is becoming cheaper inside of these little processors, we can start messing with time in ways that we couldn't do before. And so I'm actually going to do try to do something which can be a little fragile. And this is feedback experiments. And this is one of the main ways that I get some of my crazy sounds. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking the output of uh, the IntelliJ Linux, which is the mixer that I'm using, and I'm splitting it. I'm going up here to a malt, right? And I'm taking half of that malt, and I'm taking it right to my output, OK? The other part I'm splitting into the, uh, <laughs> got some problems with the, anyway. So, so the other part I'm splitting into a 4MS spectral resonator. Uh, this is one of these modules that's an example of some of the, the time domain things that we can do. Also, the 580 resampling delay is another example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take an LFO and uh, attenuate it. So I've got, let me see here, I'm going to take, where is that going? There it is. OK. I am going to trigger. So doing a couple things, a little crazy stuff here. I'm going to take the E352, and I'm going to use it as a low-frequency oscillator and trigger an envelope with it. And let's see if I can get this to work. Um, of course, always try stuff before, before you try to show it, right? Um, I might. I might just end up losing the story here if I get too far away. But, um, I'll tell a funny story. <laughs> okay, that. let me see here. I'll work on this. Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it. So, so now what I've got... You were spared the funny story. Yeah, so, so now what I've got is I've got a, a complex waveform uh, in the uh, 50, E352 and... I'm trying to get something that kind of just creates little random events. Um, and I'm going to take that envelope and I'm going to put it into a VCA. Let's see here. There's envelope out and it'll go into, uh, let's see here. Let's just do it into this VCA right here. Okay. And so we're still wiggling some of those notes. That's good. And let's see what happens. So the output of the, the resonator is going to go into the input of the mixer right here. And I'm going to put it on its own little channel I can attenuate. And now, if you've followed me, what we've got is a feedback loop, right? So what much is topic can I go back over? Yes. Yeah, so I've split the output from the Linux, and part of it's going to our output so we can actually hear what I've done, okay? The other part has gone into the spectral resonator and then back into the Linux. So there is a hard feedback loop going uh, from resonator to the VCA back to the resonator, okay? Um, and I can even do that a little differently. Let's see. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something even a little bit different. I'm going to take it out of our delay, because okay, there might be a little pop here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to split us right here. The delay out is going to be here. OK. There we go. So this is where I, I said in my introduction that sometimes you know, things can get complicated. And this is the way that I start doing sound design for my albums. Essentially, I create systems that are very chaotic and very complex. 
that I can't really control. And <coughs> then I try to build in enough subtlety that, that I can turn them down at least. Attenuation is extremely important when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, okay, let me see here. There we go. So I have to think and talk here, which is always difficult. I can talk. <laughs> so, okay, I'll you talk, talk for a second mm -hmm. while he's thinking. So I used to work at Tandy Radio Shack a long time ago. And uh, Mo came to us and said, uh, we want to put a synthesizer in Radio Shack stores. And first thing our VP of Radio Shack said was, really? What's a synthesizer? <laughs> no. He goes, how are you going to plug it in? And they went, with that quarter-inch jack right there. And he goes, we don't have any quarter-inch jacks in Radio Shack. We have RCA jacks. Could you put RCA jacks on it? And they went, why don't you just sell an adapter cable? You have adapter cables, don't you? Well, there's RCA jacks on the MG1. Because <laughs> they wouldn't put it in the store unless there are RCA jacks on it. <laughs> ah, yes, business. I have a cat named Moses. <laughs> And if, you, and if you buy an E352, there's a picture of my cat in there because we were trying to do what's called the splash screen. When you turn the power on, it shows a little rocket ship or something. So I had a graphic artist design that, but instead I, we tried to use my cat. So I put the cat in, and the intent was to take the cat out. It wasn't supposed to be a ship with the cat, except Eric Brombaugh, who does my DSP firmware, loves Moses. And Aww. so we, we left Moses in there. <laughs> but we didn't have enough, enough room to put Moses into the 370 quad. So when I was at Knobcon two weeks ago, I had four people come up and go, can I please see Moses again? <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, I also get the question, well, if Moses is in there, how can I put my pictures on there? <laughs> and I decided that would probably be as what we like to call in technical engineering terms. <laughs> A really bad idea. <laughs> yes. Okay, I think, I think I can probably start seeing if I've got something. That Back to our good. show, and here's Robert. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start turning things up here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Second, so what we should get here. So I don't yet know what's going to happen. But what I've got happening is a feedback loop and LFOs changing the delay speed, the, the delay amount, and also the multiband resonator. So, and I'm going to start. I'll turn this all down. So, right now we're all delay. Now I can inject that with new sound if I need, right? So I can turn things, wait, I can, in fact, this might be a place for that noise, but I'm gonna, yeah, maybe, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do those noise sounds. Oh, I know what, let's just unplug that, let's take that out here. Okay, so, so this is, okay, let's see. And the whole idea here is to get something that will sustain some very unusual tones. And now I've got this little percussive thing and I'm gonna put it right onto, Okay, well that was attenuating for some reason. Okay. So let's see here. So
So, so we've, we're already getting something really interesting. So, so the idea is to embrace the unusual. Now, if, when I start going into this realm, I push record because I don't know what's going to happen. And so sometimes I'll put a compressor on the outside, but I will just basically get my workstation going, push record, and I'll have the session set up so that I can run for hours because this might be, not tonight, but I might be at, at my synth for an hour and it could be that as I'm doing stuff that completely clips and sounds like crap, I'll find one little moment where I go, oh, that was cool. Don't touch it for a sec. And then I'll record like five minutes of that. And so, so we've got like, we've got an LFO right here on the delay. Okay, so let's see what happens if we turn the delay to, to analog mode instead of clean mode. So now we've got a lot of that high stuff. Let's turn that down. And now let's bring the resonance up on the... Okay, so now we're gonna start resonating. I'm gonna turn this down. And I'm gonna turn this up. Let's see. There we are, you hear that? That's the 4MS. It's taking all the stuff that's coming back, it's coming out and it's coming back in. Oh, I just lost it. Okay, so now, you've got to be really quick with your knobs, because things can go out of control really fast, right? <coughs> so, if I'm recording all of this, you see, how do you think I get my weird underwater whale sounds? and? Things that sounded like, you know, dinosaurs that were extinct. I'm riding the edge of feedback here, you see? Now I can take, let's see, right now we've got kind of a smooth LFO. So let's see what happens if we take out that smooth LFO and put a weird one. This is the E-352, kind of a random waveform. Change the echo type here. So, let's see. You get the idea that you can spend a lot of time getting not much, but then what can happen what can happen is that you can find those unusual little sounds and you can you, you, you're recording so because you're recording you've captured them and you've got some got the something showed up. exactly the whale showed up you, you've got something that maybe one of those little accidents was surprisingly cool you just don't know that yet and so Oftentimes, with this combination of feedback and complex modulation, you can get some real surprises. And I think that's what makes this environment really different from uh, working on sound design with sampling or with a wave station. And what really makes this possible is this hybrid with the realm of time domain synthesis integrated with something that has a lot of knobs and cables so that you've opened up the world to a playpen, it's a sandbox of, of experimenting, but now you've got DSP going on along with subtractive synthesis. And so never have I been a purist about synthesis, in fact, quite the opposite. I wanna, I wanna put it all into a big stew and figure out what happens when, when you mix it all up. And so, The idea is to create surprises. And what I really like about this approach is that because the only way to get use out of this is to record it. It bumps us out of our old habits, which is the worst thing that MIDI gave us, is the ability to save your decisions until the end. 
back in the 80s, the instrument developers were telling us that the cool thing about this is that we could write a song, we could do a production, and if we need to change the kick drum at the end, we can. Maybe we made a bad decision about the string synth, or something like that. You know, we can just record all the mini notes and change the patch at the end. I'll tell you, as a recording artist who's been busy for the last 35 years making electronic music, that's the worst idea in the world. The best thing you can do is commit to your sounds as you're working. And then, if you made the wrong decision, you change the work around it and make it work. Or start that track over again. Making decisions is the best way to get work done. And what happens when people have too much equipment, now I don't mean that you should stop buying things from control or anything like that, <laughs> but, but people get option freeze. You walk into your studio and you look at all of these beautiful blinky lights and patch cords and your computer and all your keyboards and you go, what should I play with today? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go crack a beer. You know, it's it, having a focused, concentrated system that makes you think out of the box and, and gets you to start making decisions, committing them, and start, you know, adding to them and warping your ideas. It, it gets music that's maybe not perfect in some mathematical ideal, but it's going to have a lot more attitude, it's going to have a lot more energy, and you're going to actually get it done instead of sit there and try to make decisions for the rest of your life. And I think that, that I know a lot of brilliant musicians who, who never finish an album because they're, they're trying to get that one lead part right, or they're, you know, they just hate their guitar tone, or, or their vocalist is always flat, and, and, you know, or, or they're taking singing lessons now because nobody can sing their lyrics. You know, it's, it's this kind of thing is you just do it. Even if you're not good enough, you put it out because there's a lot of people who are famous who aren't good enough either. And all of us just basically make stuff because it's fun and we try to get people to listen to it because otherwise we'd be alone, right? So, so the thing is, is this method of, of playing with chaos and, and, and pushing the record button, that's, that's really the key is that you get stuff recorded, you throw 90% of it away and you go, wow, that, that minute and a half was really cool and I don't even know how I got that. Save it you know, put it in a song and do it again. Get another minute and a half, save it, layer it. Before you know it, you have half an album done. That's exactly what I do. Um, and, I, and I get stuck more than anyone. I get real uh, writer's block. Um, can happen to me for months. And what I will do sometimes is either with a modular or with microphones and toys. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll set up a binaural microphone put a bunch of objects, push record, and scratch things, scribble things, you know, dip them in water, blow s bubbles, um, you know, hit rubber bands against resonating devices. And then, and then I'll sample it and turn it into pads or something. Or I'll just do what I showed you here and start playing in, in a kind of crazy chaotic way. But then, apply a lot of, of cutting to that and, and get that little bit of magic that I don't even know how it was done. And so that's just a few tips. I think, I think I'm done talking. If anybody has questions, now is a great time. Um, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, what a, usually it, in my studio, I and mean, this is all a studio process I'm talking about. Because mm -hmm. I wanna, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, repeat your question because the last time the audio was muted from the audience. Oh, okay. How about so, if I repeat your question then so that, that's, that way we'll make sure. Um, she was asking after I finish uh, doing the editing of all the little good bits, uh, what do I do then? Well, <laughs> usually I'm in the studio and I, I'm working in Logic, all this works in Pro Tools or anything else, is I'll... I'll put those bits sometimes on a big, huge timeline. Um, in fact, one of the best tricks I have, and <laughs> it's almost so good I shouldn't give it away, is I make my albums as one song. Like, I, I create a timeline in Logic that's 60 minutes long or 80 minutes long, and, and I'll start plunking them in, and I'll start moving them around 
until I've got a flow of energy that's starting to tell a story that's been in my head. Because usually this all starts with intention. Um, you know, with the idea of I want to tell a story like this, you know, a story of, you know, uh, about birds or about our own extinction or about, uh, you know, going insane or whatever, you know, just like whatever the story is that's starting to pop up. Usually I have a concept and, and I'll go, this feels like a beginning of an album or this feels like an end of an album or somewhere in the middle. And I'll just kind of slide them around like those little tile games, you know, and and then I'll go, oh, that doesn't work here anymore. So I'll just shove it over to the end. You know, like I'll, I'll, the timeline might be four hours long. And I'll just kind of, sh usually there's a big pile up of weird sample bits out in the three hour zone. And then I'll kind of go back and I'll, and I'll go, boy, the, this was a cool beginning. And, you know, that weird little, you know, falling tweet into a blorp sound was the way I want to start the album. So now I go, oh, wait a minute. Now I feel like there should be a growth under that. So let's see, I'll do this, this, this. It starts writing itself. And sometimes all we need is a little seed to plant. And so, so I just try to assemble them until they start suggesting ideas. Well, why don't you talk about your last album, The Bio, about you know, what your thinking of the theme was and um, that Yeah, we could do it. First of all, actually, before we go too late, I should mention that, that I've got some CDs here. So if anybody's interested, George in the corner here uh, has a couple of my recent titles, so the Biode and, and a few of the more recent ones. You can also get them downloaded on um, Bandcamp and things like that, just robertrich.bandcamp. So enough of that. Also my gig tomorrow night at uh, St. Anne's and the Holy Cross, I think it is, uh, on the other side of Brooklyn. I don't know where it is. I don't know Brooklyn at all. Um, so anyway, um, uh, the, so the Biode, this is an album that I released in January, and um, I wanted to do something that was really rhythmic and dynamic because the three albums I did before then were pretty brooding and dark because I've been rather pissed off at the human race lately. Um, so uh, the theme, you know, I mentioned there's usually a theme. The theme was the, the idea that, that we are all a porous membrane and that there's no such thing as individuality, and that in fact our consciousness is built up from a constantly reorganizing bunch of organisms, you know, uh, bacteria, fungi, you know, viruses that have made themselves part of us. And even, even our organelles in the cells are, you know, some ancient virus that entered a, you know, a, a single cell creature three billion years ago, you know, our mitochondria. So th this idea that we're actually a collaboration of organisms starts making me think, well, why are we even ourselves? Um, you know, and, if this is a collaboration and I imagine it to be a self, well, wh when we look at things like an anthill or, or like clouds or like plankton in the currents of the water, maybe they're conscious. Perhaps those, organ perhaps those systems, a very complex system, is somehow reacting intelligently to its environment and processing and changing its environment. We know that organisms change the world, change the, change the atmosphere. Um, so this idea of everything intertwining and interacting into systems of relationships started becoming a more poetic idea into an abstraction of music. And so the music's pretty weird. <laughs> it's, uh, it starts out very primordial and visceral and bubbling up, kind of like some of these things I was just showing you. Um, uh, actually, one of them started as a piece I did for Moog Music because they gave me uh, a Voyager SE to give them three pieces for its end of life. Uh, they, they do this for each of their products when they decide to stop making it. They pick a musician to, to, to get the product as a gift and make three pieces out of it. And so one of those pieces um, is on the biode and it's all, it's all Voyager, in fact. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it's called as uh, recalcitrant malfeasance. It's the opening, it's track one. It's the opening track, yeah. You can't spell that, it's track one. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so I also wanted that album to be pushing some of the, the modern uh, modular synth things a little farther as well. And so to a certain extent, it's, it's kind of a sequel to Bestiary that I did um, you know, 18 years ago or something, in that I wanted this kind of hybrid modular expansion of, of the tools that we have, but to take it out of the cliche realms. Um, so it doesn't sound like Wendy Carlos or Tangerine Dream or, um, you know, techno. And 
try to find a new sound. So it, in the end, it just kind of sounds like one of my albums, I guess, because there's flutes and there's guitars and there's percussion and things. But, um, but there's a lot of modular synth on it as well. And, and I'm trying to uh, integrate these tools into a production environment that's, that's fluid and, and, and actually you know, can express a lot of different musical ideas. Oftentimes, people don't even realize that there's modular synth in some of my music because it sounds like underwater recordings um, or it sounds like forest noises and animals and stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of times, and I, I actually have John Simonton of Paia to thank for this because the system that I built back when I was a teenager was so incapable of playing Klaus Schulze that the only thing I could do with it was make insect noises. And so I, I ended up with a whole vocabulary of insect noises of how to make, of how to make synthesizers chirp and burble um, because I couldn't make them stay in tune, you know. Uh, but uh, to me, the real joy is finding the organic within the electronic and then merging that with the emotional and with things that are played with lungs and, and fingers and muscles and, and finding ways to sonically merge them so that you don't really know where one begins and the other ends. And often the way to do that is to take the acoustic sounds, the flutes or the piano or something, and process them weirdly, and then to take the electronic sounds and to, to smooth them out a little bit so they aren't quite so electronic-y. And, and in the end, we, we trick the ear into hearing the electronics in, in a more organic uh, context. We expand the blur zone, you know, that, that uh, what is it? There's an art term they call it, uncanny valley, which is becoming more commonly used now with animation. Like, and, and, and this idea of the uncanny valley is like, at what point do we stop thinking that it's artificial and we start perceiving it as real or as, as human? And of course, it's changing. It's a cultural shift because film animation, all, you know, all these films made with digital uh, processing nowadays, uh, people think, wow, that looked so real. But then we look at something from 20 years ago that people thought looked real and we go, oh man, you can see all the jagged edges. You know, you can see all the quantization of the pixels and things. So, so this, this uncanny valley keeps shifting as our technology shifts and we get more used to it. So one of the tricks that we've always used is, is to blend some of the real in with some of the synthetic. So if you want to create a really convincing synthesized horn section, play five horns and have a sax player with you, you know, and uh, you know, use samples and, and have a couple horn players. And suddenly your, your, your trumpet and your saxophone being acoustic will be part of an ensemble of six sampled musicians and people won't notice the samples because they'll cue into the real trumpet and the real saxophone. Um, and so that's not unlike the way I'm talking about the ways of integrating uh, pure synthesis in with organic sounds is, is that you, you add one little thing that's real and it tricks the brain into hearing all of the rest of it in a different context. So that's one way I'm using these things for like uh, creating ambient uh, forest noises or outdoor sounds, um, night noises and things like that, is that I'll, I'll actually bring in one real recording of crickets in a field and add a bunch of modular synth creatures out in the distance and you hear it as being a strange real place because of you know that blending of we, we cue into the real and then the artificial starts uh, fitting in somehow any other questions anything you can ask yeah I have a question for Paul or it's for about the way that it's software okay. um, when you import a sample like and, and then it um, lays it out on the, uh, the uh, yeah, on the harmonic scene. Um, is that speeding up the sample, or is it like, is it just taking one little clip from it? Okay, so she was asking about our free software program, WaveEdit, and WaveEdit is what you can use to load your own wavetables into either the quad or the single oscillator through an SD card. Um, so what we do is we have an import function. And it's very difficult for a lot of people to understand the difference between 
this in a program that is playing samples, Thanks. for example, serum or something like that. So what we do is whatever you put in, and I think the software can accommodate up to an, uh, a sample that's about eight minutes long. You say, well, how can I put an eight-minute sample into a wavetable bank that's only got you know, 64 wavetables of 256 samples? And the answer is a lot of processing and a lot of time slicing. So what we do is we read in your whole sample. Let's say it's a minute long, all right? Then we divide it into 64 sections. And then we look at each of the 64 sections and we make a best spectral guess of what that section together should sound like. And that's what is loaded as a single wavetable into the array of 64. And so that means we have to do a lot of guessing and a lot of quote throwing away. But we do a pretty decent job. And so what we have to give up usually <coughs> when you do that is upper harmonic content. That tends to be sacrificed. But we still, if you, if, you, if you play something in that's a minute long, the first part of it will be wave one, and the very last thing you stuck in there will be wave 64. Okay, so it doesn't truncate it. It just tries to do a, what we call a best fit. So the way that it works is we don't have a time restriction. So when you think of sampling, you think of, well, I can put you know, 10 minutes or five seconds or some time of my sample. This is, we have a restriction of the number of samples. So there's no time. And people say, well, what's the sample rate? And I go, there is no sample rate. And they don't know what that, how can that be? It has to have a sample rate. The answer is, no, not really, because it's, it's, it's reading in the data that you gave it. So the best way to think about it is this. It has about 16K of memory in it. So if you have a sample rate of 32 kilohertz, how long is that? Bueller, it's half a second, right? <laughs> Come on, half a second. So I can put in a half a second at 32 kilohertz, one second at 16 kilohertz, and not, quote, lose anything. All right, but if you sample at 48 kilohertz, all right, how long is that? We're not going to do the math in our heads. Quarter of a second. <laughs> you say, well, that's too short, okay? Because I have a vocal sound that has like a rising pitch that lasts maybe a second and a half. I go, well, then we're going to have to start, quote, throwing stuff away. And what we throw away, what you hear is the upper high harmonics. Those start rolling off. And so... I do a demo at trade shows where I take a WAV file, just a standard dot .wav, that's the format we work in, of Curly from the Three Stooges, okay, going, I tried to think and it hurt my brain. And that sample lasts about a second and a half, but when I stick it through wave edit and fill up a whole bank and you play it back, you can tell that it's Curly and you can pretty much hear what he says. Now, it sounds kind of like lo-fi curly on an insonic mirage curly, okay. But it's still there. And that's the trade-off that we make. So it's really interesting to put in a very long sample, four or five minutes, and see what comes out. You can still hear a lot of, like, I put in vocal samples and you can hear, like, my voice. It's right. crazy. You can still tell that it's you because that's in the mid-range. So female voices generally don't have much frequency content above about 500 hertz. So you can pretty much tell that it's you. As we like to say, I used to design cell phones for Blackberry. If we like to say that we want grandma to sound like grandma. Not robot grandma, not somebody else's grandma, but we want grandma to sound like grandma. And so um, there's a lot of post-processing in a way that it that we try to do a good job. And I encourage everyone to, to go to my website, uh, synthtech.com, and download a copy of WaveEdit. It runs on PC, Mac, and Linux. It's free. It's open source. If you don't like the way we did it, then you try. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on.
It's only 60,000 lines of code. It's not too bad. <laughs> It was done by a grad student who also uh, is working for Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. <laughs> yeah, so he also, by the way, there's another program. He's that, a rocket scientist. <laughs> that, yeah, he's a rocket science. Named Andrew Belt, and he wrote another program that you may have heard of called VCV Rack, which is a basically a soft Euro rack synthesizer sort of a thing. And so a lot of the algorithms that he developed for WaveEdit, it's in VCV Rack. But wave edit is really fun to play with, and it gives you a nice visual representation of the kinds of sounds what Robert's talking about, where we have Hammond organs here, we have the sine wave harmonics here. The waves are set up like a chessboard. So think of an eight by eight chessboard. And that's how the waves are stacked inside of the wave edit. Any other questions while we're here? Yes, sir? Is uh, Carly in the 330? The E330. Okay, so. The E330 is my low-cost <laughs> oscillator. That's like a little sampling of the other oscillators. And those have um, 16 wavetables, and those are fixed, and the, you can't be upgraded. But they are the E350 original wavetables, which are all the same wavetables in here. The curly's not in there. Okay. <laughs> right. There's no curly in the E330. Don't go hunting for curly. And, and, <laughs> no. and what else is not in there? Moses the cat. He's not in there either. <laughs> Got to pay extra for that. <laughs> you have to pay extra for Moses the cat. <laughs> Anybody else have a question while you're here? Okay, if, if no, I'm going to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Robert for... Thank you. Thank you. It's not like I pressured, pressured him into this or anything, is it? I was so, already here. <laughs> why don't you fly out a day early while that you're out here? Well, yeah. And also, you know, thanks to Rochelle and Darren and Jonas at Control. <laughs> and I hope it actually went on live stream. We'll see what happens. If not, um, there's also going to be a posted video of this on YouTube at some future date <laughs> um, that has a performance as well. And if you're really a glutton for punishment, I've asked, this is my third time to give a little talk. You can Google Paul Schreiber, perf uh, Paul Schreiber Control. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm tired. Paul Schreiber Control. Don't Google the other thing. It'll blow up your computer. And uh, you can see my other previous talks as well. <laughs> but again, thanks for coming. I hope to see you all tomorrow night at the Ambient Church where you actually get to hear Robert take his hands, these are your hands, and push keys on what's called the keyboard <laughs> that has black yeah. and white things on it that you push it and sound comes out. So I encourage <laughs> everyone to come see that tomorrow. Yeah, it's, Thanks it's, again. It's not just Ableton. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to talk to Robert, come on up. Yeah, please. And if you want to talk to George. George has a few George has a few CDs back there if that inch, if anybody listens to those things anymore, I don't know. Yeah, they're round things so music can come they, out. They look shiny, you can use them as rainbow makers. Thanks for your mother having us. Got one person knows what it is. Hot dog. Thank you. 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 Thank